ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forms possible since 1983 when, wait for it, McDonald's introduced McNuggets. <laughs> I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. And we thank today's special sponsors, Mike Margolin and Mike Carberry. I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the UI Library's digital archives. I'd like to take just a minute now to recognize uh, three of our interns who are graduating this month. I think at least two of them are here, maybe three. So I'd ask uh, Jiang Shu, In He Che, and Claire Botcher to please come forward. I think at least one of them's here. Come on up. So we are uh, presenting them with our coveted ICFRC mugs. There you go. And we, we thank them for their work with ICFRC. And there's one more coming. I think he may come in late. This uh, finals week has messed up everybody's schedules. So I'll try to recognize him when he comes in. Uh, at the end of our talk. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Paul Greeno. He's, as I mentioned before, he's an emeritus professor of modern Indian history, Indian history, and of community and behavioral health at the University of Iowa. He was the director of the University's South Asian Studies Program and co-director of the Global Health Studies Program. He earned his bachelor's degree from Columbia University and his PhD from the University of Chicago. His recent research concerns themes in India's environmental history and the history of public health and the introduction of field epidemiology into the post-colonial world. He's the author of many successful works in his field of study. And during 2016-17, he was a senior Fulbright Nehru fellow attached to the Department of History at Jadavpur University. Please join me in welcoming Paul Greeno. Thank you, uh, Dave Martin, and also to Ed Zastro for inviting me and uh, making it possible for me to speak about a topic in which I have become passionately interested. Uh, I, am, uh, I am an Indian uh, historian, as uh, was uh, stated, and uh, most of my work has been in the, uh, envir on the environmental side, has been on uh, tiger preservation, the conservation of threatened tiger species uh, in India. So this interest in crows is rather more recent. Uh, I want to just begin by playing a brief video. It's on YouTube and you can see it yourself. It's in a foreign language, but some universal things are happening here and I think you'll understand what it is that's taking place. <laughs> I'm <laughs> 
We live in an age of environmental crises. They're so familiar. They're on our lips. They're on the media every day. Many of us, many of you in this room I know, are volunteers or donors that somehow do the best we can to ameliorate uh, some of these crises. The age collectively has been referred to as the age of the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene. It's the geological era we now live in. It's characterized by uh, industrial and agricultural practices which are so extensive, so energetic, that have begun to alter the surface of the earth and of living creatures uh, in it, on it, above it, and in its seas and lakes and so on. The crises associated with it are ubiquitous pollution in the Anthropocene, ubiquitous pollution. There is not a place on earth where you cannot find a plastic molecule. Global warming and rising sea levels, we're beginning to teach this to our uh, young students in elementary schools, which is a good thing. Uh, the crisis is advancing very rapidly. And species extinction and the accelerating loss of biodiversity. These are all terms which we've all learned, I along with the rest of you, in the last 10 or 15 years. Suddenly, the, the, future, the future of the planet and our place in it looks really quite bleak. So these are the crises of the Anthropocene. Of them, uh, I am particularly interested in this question of biodiversity lost in the extinction of species. Now the question is, what can an environmental historian do? A historian works with the tools of articles, books, talks, and lectures, and so on. Pretty, pretty weak weapons considering the scale, the immensity of the uh, hazards and the crises which are upon it. But in India in particular, there is a field, an emerging field of environmental history, and uh, the question is, what small contribution would I be able to make uh, with the uh, uh, materials and the skills uh, which I have. Now there's a classic strategy for talking about biodiversity loss in India in particular. It's to describe the threats to large charismatic animals, the really big ones, elephants, tigers, and rhinoceroses. And people go to India to see these extraordinarily attractive, very, very beautiful animals. And uh, they indeed are uh, surviving w uh, with considerable uh, uh, risk to them, but nonetheless are managing to survive in India, perhaps more than any other place in Asia. India has done a rather remarkable job at making provision for their conservation. The problem, though, in changing people's behavior and habits, the kinds of consumption that lead to the environmental crises that we face, that is, for those of us who live in urban areas and in cities, and this is particularly true of Indians also, is that they're very far away from these large megafauna, these charismatic animals. It occurred to me that another strategy that might be tried to raise consciousness and concern in India, also here, but particularly in India because that's kind of my beat, would be to look at wild animals which are threatened but in more urban areas. That is, animals that people see on a day-to-day -day basis, not in remote uh, jungles and mountains uh, at a great distance and therefore hard to reach and hard to understand. So having settled on a strategy like this, the question comes, well, what particular animal could one choose to make the focus of a, um, uh, an effort to, to raise uh, concern? And there are a limited number of candidates. Now here we're not talking about um, uh, cattle roaming through the streets of large cities, which is something one definitely sees in India, nor pariah dogs or pie dogs, which are there in vast numbers in India cities and so on, because these are animals which are in a relationship of domesticity with the Indian population. So we're talking only about wild species. Of the wild species in urban areas, it's pretty much limited to geckos, which are little lizards, very attractive little lizards that wander up and down the walls in India and eat mosquitoes and so on, and they're very benign and gentle. Uh, sparrows, which are a, a threatened and very attractive species, we all know sparrows ourselves, vultures and crows. These are the four um, uh, most prominent. And of those, as you can tell from what I've said before, it's the, uh, it's the Indian uh, house crow that I'm, that I'm interested in. So I've settled on, I'm sort of zeroing down here onto a particular species with some very specific threats uh, in uh, India. Now this house crow, this is a picture of the house crow and you saw him in the video and so on. 
These are a native species of India. This is very distinct. Its range is confined, as you can see on this small map, uh, basically from Iran to uh, Burma and from the Himalayas uh, to the bottom of, uh, of uh, Ceylon. This is, an, and this is a species that has evolved in India, and that is its, uh, its uh, native, uh, native uh, terrain. Now, at this point, I have to make a, uh, a disclosure uh, that I am uh, compromised uh, and uh, I speak here as a uh, as a, a partisan. I made first contact. I was first encountered. I had my first encounter with house crows, not in India, but in uh, Tanzania a number of uh, years ago. And the house crows, uh, some of the elders of the local house crow community, approached me and uh, tried to offer me a proposition. But I dismissed them, thinking this was you know this is bird nonsense. I didn't have to pay any attention. But they were very uh, persistent, and they wanted something very specific from me. They wanted me to play a role in a favorable campaign that would emphasize their native genius, that the house crows regarded themselves as a genius species, a kind of superstar, which was underappreciated. There was some doubt about that. And uh, they also wanted to try to reverse a tide of uh, disrespect, disregard, in fact, of insult, which is very common in India. When people in Indian cities talk about the house crow, they tend to uh, sneer and say disparaging things about them. And the house crows, uh, were uh, disturbed by this, and they were looking for a human, an articulate human who would play a role in trying to reverse a tide of opinion, uh, which was beginning to globally turn, uh, turn against them. Well, in the winter of 2015, I was in India, and they approached me again. And I was a little more amenable to this because I was on the point of uh, retirement, ready to take up a new uh, project. So we came to an agreement. The contract is there on the right. You can read it. Uh, <laughs> That, uh, that I would, uh, that I would uh, speak on their behalf uh, publicly, um, more or less like uh, Ronald Reagan, Reagan you know, uh, spoke for, uh, for General Electric in the past, you know, someone who would be identified with their cause, and that I would write a book about them, and that in return, then this was my part of the contract, they would secure a, uh, a research fellowship for me to go and spend six months in uh, India. Uh, so I uh, signed on, and they kept their part of it, and uh, they got the grant for me, so I went to India for six months over the winter of 2016-2017. So that's, uh, that's my disclosure. Now, there are two species of crows in India, just, uh, just very quickly. One is a jungle crow, which is all black, and as the title tells you, lives in the jungle primarily. The other is the house crow, which has a gray um, cowl or collar around it. You can see it's very, well, it's very evident there, especially in the bottom picture. You can always tell these house crows. And they're called house crows because they hang around people's houses. They are very uh, closely associated with human beings and have evolved or co-involved uh, uh, alongside Indians uh, uh, for over the last 10,000 years or so in uh, India. They roost and they nest in trees immediately adjacent to people's residences. This is true in village areas, but it's particularly true in urban areas, or they actually rest in the cornices and crevices of uh, people's uh, construction. So the point is that there is a close, indeed an intimate relationship between the house crow or uh, urban uh, crows and Indians, and one could say that the soundtrack of India for the last 5,000 years of its history has been the caw caw kind of crows in the background. In any recording made on the street in India, if you don't hear motorcycles, you will hear uh, the, the cawing the of the crow. It's a, it's a constant and has been a constant uh, present there. Now, the most famous of all the ornithologists in India is a man named Salim Ali, and there you see is one of the ten volumes of a handbook he wrote with an American named Dylan Ripley. He's the most, Salim Ali, the most famous of the ornithologists. He says, the house crow is a confirmed commensal of man, almost an element of his social system, of the human social system. A commensal. What is a commensal? It comes from the Latin co-mensa, sitting at the same table. The house crow eats alongside human, uh, human beings. It isn't that the place is set for them at the table. They make a place for them at the table by attacking food, in particular feeding on the garbage and the food wastes which are left over from meals. That's where you will find crows. Wherever food is being prepared or served or disposed of, that's where the house crow will be found, usually in very large numbers. So crows, and to some extent dogs, were the garbage disposal mechanism of India as far back as one uh, can reasonably uh, infer. 
So house crows have co-evolved alongside India. I want to make that point. Co-evolution means that two species affect each other. So house crows have had an effect on humans, just as human provision of foodstuffs have shaped and directed the uh, survival of uh, house crows. So they're inter inter uh, dependent. Now, house crows are a member of a larger uh, genus of birds, and I know that there are a number of very competent bird lovers in the room, um, even bird experts, but just suffice it to say, uh, a family of uh, birds called the corvids, and the corvids make up the most uh, intelligent, the most capable of all the, of all the bird species. They, along with parrots, are at the very top of the measurable, experimentally measurable uh, intelligence among the birds. They are problem-solving birds. When they're faced with a problem, they set to it with uh, rationality and logic, with experiment, with trial and error, uh, a variety of mechanisms to solve any problem that faces them. And they are also tool-using. Crows are very uh, facile, given that they don't have hands. They nonetheless have the ability to shape material, uh, uh, sticks and uh, so on, uh, to uh, get uh, what they want. Corvids are, unlike most other birds, able to recognize themselves in mirrors. They see themselves, they display emotions, and they possess what has been recognized as a degree of self-consciousness. They are self-aware. Self-aware perhaps like a small child, but nonetheless, they have a sense of their own identity at the individual level. And comparative ethology, animal studies have shown that crows, corvids, of which crows are a member of this uh, family, this grouping, have intelligence absolutely comparable to that of the great apes, gorillas, and chimpanzees. There was a huge uh, debate, indeed, a, a struggle inside the biological research community about this. The apes and monkey people did not want to admit this, but it was demonstrated uh, again and again, and finally, grudgingly, the ape people have made space at the table of recognition for the corvid researchers. Salim Ali refers to uh, um, corvids as feathered apes in your garden, making the point that they are much closer and more intimate to us. Few of us have chimpanzees in our gardens, but you do have feathered apes. These crows in Iowa, they're a different species, but they are also highly intelligent, highly capable, probably the smartest animal uh, that you'll see any place in, uh, in Iowa. So there have been experimental proofs of uh, animal uh, in, uh, intelligence, and the result of these researches, not just with corvids, not just with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, apes and chimpanzees and so on, but also with other species like elephants, porpoises, whales, and so on, have demonstrated a new reality which has begun to reshape the way in which the scientific, but also the community of, uh, of uh, intellectuals uh, and educated people generally, is that animals possess not just intelligence, but consciousness. So when we interact with an animal, we're interacting with uh, um, um, beings which, though not exactly like us, share some of those qualities which we think of as making us as human. That is, they have emotion, they have reflection, they have consciousness, and they certainly feel pain. And this has begun to produce a welcome, uh, overdue transition in the way in which we treat animals in general. And I'm simply drawing your attention to one species, which are birds, uh, a particular species of birds in India. One of the phenomena when you go to India, if you go to large cities like Mumbai or uh, Kolkata or, or uh, New Delhi, is in the evening, uh, crows will mass in trees by the thousands and thousands. And you have to be careful not to walk under those trees in the evenings. They're making a huge racket and a dropping a lot of shit, all going on at the same time. And there's been a tendency to disparage that. But now what the uh, bird scientists tell us is that this is a neural net. This is a form of communication in which the experiences of the day are being shared. It's a kind of uh, mass version of, uh, honey, how was your day? Only they're, they're talking to each other and uh, forming uh, some notion of dangers and opportunities in the environment. I, I don't mean to make light of it. The subsistence of these birds depends upon their ability to communicate about these matters uh, with, each, with each other. Now, an interesting thing is that it is not at all uncommon in India that crows are fed on a daily basis, usually by women, cooked food. People may say disparaging things about crows, but it's not at all unusual to go out in the morning and see plates or leaves covered with 
uh, rice or bits of chapati left over from the meal or specially prepared set aside. So there is a, um, a mass process of feeding these animals uh, going on very quietly. Nobody draws attention to it, and it doesn't seem particularly strange. Just as many of you, in fact, I would guess most of you here, it's not strange for you to put food that you bought, at, uh, money out of your pocket, to put in a bird feeder uh, because you take a certain degree of satisfaction in it. And the question is, what is that nature of that satisfaction? What is it that you think you're accomplishing by feeding the birds? Do you think that birds cannot survive in the wild without you? In any case, in India, this act of benevolence toward uh, um, crows in particular, this is not for all birds. They're not feeding sparrows. They're not feeding pigeons. They're feeding crows. That is the intentionality of this. Now, because of the fact that uh, crows survive by eating on human waste and garbage, and that they are fed uh, uh, in particular in individual households, usually by the lady of the household, the woman of the household, by offering them food. Crows develop something which is a quasi-property relationship, or you can say that they are the uh, the shirt-tail cousin who has shown up, but they have certain demands that they make, and they can be very vocal. And that's what you saw in the video I showed you before. That crow was not a pet but it did have expectations of that woman and was very insistent, as you saw. The crow said, feed me, where's my food, and so on. That uh, one can find uh, uh, um, frequently. So a personal relationship often opens up between particular crows and, uh, and uh, individuals, and this is uh, this is sort of below the level of, uh, of recognition. People don't uh, write about this, they don't talk about it, but if you go, as I did in my six months spent in India, and you talk to classes of students and audiences and so on, people smile and say, oh yes, my grandmother does this, my mother does this, or my sister and I were taught to do this by my mother in the past, we don't do it anymore, but we, we really should think about doing it again, and so on. In return, crow sometimes bring shiny objects. They'll pick up things and bring them and deposit them at the feet of or on the uh, shelf or the floor of uh, the houses where they have been uh, benevolently cared for and fed by uh, the women, women of the house. It's a, it's a peculiar kind of relationship. These are wild animals, mind you, but they behave in many ways almost as if they were pets. Now, if you go to the formal culture of India, not this informal behavioral stuff, but to the written culture of India. In particular, if you go to the text of India, the great text of India, the Sanskrit text, the religious and philosophical text of India, and you look up crows, you begin to explore, you find crows are not regarded benevolently at all. They are considered to be polluting, dangerous, inauspicious. You should have nothing to do with crows. You want to keep your distance from them. I've given you a couple examples of ancient texts. These are sacred texts. These are the sacred texts of the Hindus looking here. But you see you have these appalling statements, a woman, a shudra, which is an untouchable, if effectively. A woman, a shudra, a dog, and a crow are untruth. The Brahmin student should not look at these lest he mingle excellence with sin. So contact with women, dogs, crows, this is bad news if you're studying for your, um, your Sanskrit exams. Another from Manushmriti. This is the most famous uh, legal philosophical text in India. Hugely important <coughs> text from the second, uh, maybe as old as the second uh, century BC, probably a little newer than that. A woman, a shudra, a dog, and a crow are not fit for the Vedas, that is for learning, for learning the sacred knowledge, which is confined by the Brahmins, by oral techniques to their, their own caste and is not shared with uh, outsiders. So you can see this disparagement is, uh, is a frequent feature of the, uh, of the uh, high texts of uh, Indian tradition. On the other hand, and notice that this talk takes the form of on the other hand, because the place of the crow is complicated. It's not a simple story. There are many aspects to this at different levels of culture among different groups of people. But on the other hand, the crow is also respected and feared. And one reason is, is that a very powerful and important god, the, the god called Shani, who is the god of, uh, and he's the god of the planet Saturn, or the equivalent of Saturn in the Indian uh, um, astrological uh, uh, pantheon. And this god Shani uh, is very potent. He brings illness, suffering, and death if he is crossed. So you don't want to cross Shani. Well, Shani, like all the gods in the Indian tradition, he has a personal mount 
a mount or a vehicle, a means of transportation. These gods all sit on the back of something. Okay, and the mount for Shani is the house crow. Here's an illustration from a, uh, from a text, and you see there is a Shani uh, looking very dangerous indeed, and uh, the crow is his, is his uh, vehicle. So the point is, is that the crow that you see bouncing around on the streets in Calcutta or New Delhi, uh, uh, scavenging for food, that crow is, in some sense, the representative of Shani, and therefore not to be trifled with and you can't trifle with them. I tried to get a taxidermist to catch a crow for me in Bombay and stuff it so I could bring it here for a lecture like this today. It'd be very nice to have a, a crow here. They wouldn't do it. No one would agree to go and kill a crow for me, although there are probably millions of them running around in, in, uh, in uh, New Delhi. Now, the behavior of crows, their intelligence, their proximity, their ubiquity, the obvious and um, uh, uh, subtlety of their interactions with humans, which are modulated according to the crow's perceptions of how threatening or how benevolent you are to the crow, have made them attractive and even endearing to Indian intellectuals, especially in the modern period. That is, you know, from the, uh, say, the 18th, 19th century forward. So we find in all parts of India, well, I shouldn't say all parts, I don't know this for a fact, but in many parts of India, you will find, if you begin to inquire, that crows have been described and incorporated into poetry, texts, into popular sayings, tales, understandings, folk tales, uh, uh, and the like. It's really, really quite uh, remarkable. They lend themselves to fabulization, that is, fables, in which you talk about crows and the behavior of crows, but what you really is doing is criticizing human society, human behavior. You know about fables, we know Greek fables and so on, right? And this is this something very similar that goes on in, in uh, India. But crows also lend themselves to social satire because they're small and they, uh, 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 they threaten no one and they're slightly ridiculous, they eat garbage. I mean, there are a lot of things about crows which are less than uh, in, endearing. And you can satirize human behavior by talking about the behavior of crows. In any case, uh, this uh, 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 situation of crows, of be being both very intelligent but at the same time degraded, uh, practicing a degraded occupation, that is, that is scavenging food uh, from the street, garbage and so on, and their association with death and dying because they're associated with the god Shani and so on. All of this uh, allows crows or gives crows the capacity as symbols to evoke allegories of exclusion and even of untouchability. So crows sort of in the uh, hierarchy of animals in India uh, occupy some of the space in human society which are occupied by, uh, by uh, untouchables, or so I would assert. assert. Finally, and I, I'm just sort of ranging quickly over some of the cultural attributes or cultural connections between crows and, and Indian uh, in India. Crows, for uh, many Hindus, play a critical role in funerary ceremonies, of funeral ceremonies. In uh, India, when a Hindu dies, here I'm speaking broadly, the corpse is quickly disposed of, but a ceremony to placate the spirit of the person who has died and to send that spirit into the land of the ancestors, eventually to be reborn, but sent to the land of the ancestors, you need a funerary ceremony called a shraddo. And these ceremonies are, are complicated and they vary in different parts of India, but a key element in almost all of them is at the very end, rice balls, which have been prepared by priests and blessed with various kinds of invocations and prayers and so on, rice balls are symbolically fed to the ancestor by offering these rice balls to crows. And crows must come forward and eat the rice balls, thereby signifying that food of a sort, symbolic food of course, has been given to the ancestor. The ancestor is energized and then in the course of time goes off to the, to the land of the ancestors where he belongs. You don't want the spirit of the dead hanging around the house. This is very, this is very uh, inauspicious, uh, not, to be, not to be desired. And uh, so th my point is that the crows are so ubiquitous, so common, so close to Indians that Indians in the past unselfconsciously incorporated a wild animal into a critical ritual. The relation between the living and dead is at stake in this ritual. Grandfather has died. We want grandfather to be happy in the beyond 
but we are actually dependent upon a crow to eat a rice ball. Well, what would happen if crows didn't show up? Crows are disappearing from urban India. It isn't a uniform process, but it's a definite widespread process in different parts of India. I've given here just a few uh, uh, examples in the first one from 2006, talking about the city of Allahabad, which is in North India on the Ganges. The headline writer says, crow idols appear in the midst of declining bird population. And if you go and read this story, what it means is because crows have not been coming to take the rice balls, crisis, 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 the funerary priests have carved crows out of wood, painted them black, given them button eyes, and symbolically fed the rice ball to the crow. This is very unsatisfactory. This substitution of a mute piece of wood for a living a crow is, uh, is uh, clearly not entirely satisfactory, but it is a necessary expedient. Otherwise, the dead can never be unloaded. The second, crows do a vanishing act, refers to uh, the expectation that crows for a particular annual cycle where all ancestors are worshipped by feeding crows. There's a period, a two-week period in India where uh, all, not specific dead ancestors, but all dead ancestors for pious Hindus must be honored and propitiated and fed by giving rice balls to crows. And the disappearance of the crows has created a particular crisis. This is from the city of Kanpur, also in North India. And the, this has even drawn, gotten into the attention of the English language newspaper writers. The third example refers to uh, Bangalore, Bengaluru now, Bangalore, uh, from 2014, in which the house crow is slowly disappearing. The same thing. Bangalore is in the other end of the country, down in the south center of the country. And the final uh, uh, example here, no crows for the offering in Mumbai uh, in September 2017. So this is something which has begun to happen over the last 10 years or so and is accelerating as the pressure, the environmental pressures on crows have built up and crows are less and less uh, abundant. There are some parts of India. In December, uh, a group of us from the University of Students and Faculty went to the city of Udaipur in Rajasthan in western India, and there wasn't a single crow to be found. Well, that's not quite true. There was one crow to be found. We challenged the students. I said, I'll give you $10 to the first person who takes a picture of a crow in Udaipur. One student found one crow. She got the $10. It's a very good uh, photographer. Uh, Margaret Beckett came back here. She uh, uh, can confirm this. She, uh, she was in Udaipur with us. No crows. In fact, there were no crows, as far as we could see, in southeastern Rajasthan. They weren't just disappearing from the city. They had just disappeared. Very, very uh, striking. Now, the exact uh, 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 measurement, the quantification of this disappearing that is going on is very hard to form. India only very recently instituted those uh, uh, scientific-based uh, methods of mass observation, which were invented at Cornell University Laboratory of Ornithology in the United States and now become global. There is a mechanism by which volunteer bird watchers can, on a particular day, uh, list uh, all the species that they, they observe, and this goes into a particular kind of software which is then uploaded globally, and you can find out every place in the world. And as over time these observations accrue, then you have some notion of the trends. But it's only been in operation for three years in India, so we don't have really good trend uh, statistics. But in the course of time, uh, I think this disappearance of the crow and other species is going to be a measurable, quantifiable uh, using those, uh, those uh, methods. Now, why are crows disappearing? This is the, this is the question. This is the interesting question, uh, or one of the very interesting uh, questions. There are a number of hypotheses. I've run these hypotheses by ornithologists at a, uh, India has a very well-staffed, uh, well-funded central uh, research uh, institution called the Salim Ali, that's that famous ornithologist again, the Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and National, uh, uh, Natural uh, History. It's in Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu in the south of India. And I went there, spent a couple of days there, talked to the uh, uh, researchers uh, there, and we made up a list of the likely causes of the disappearance of crows. Of course, these are causes also that might cause the disappearance of other species too, but we're just focused on the crow for the moment. So what are they? Well, mechanical trauma. India it has a 8% uh, 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 
uh, GNP growth rate. We haven't seen that in the United States in 70 years, okay? An 8% uh, growth rate. It's a rapidly developing economy. It's a capitalist economy and therefore very unequally distributed. But nonetheless, the country's growing very rapidly. There's a lot of money, especially in cities. People are buying cars. If they can't afford cars, then they're buying new motorcycles. Cars and motorcycles clogging the streets of Indian cities. It is a hazard for pedestrians to walk around in uh, Indian cities, all Indian cities. Crows play a ground game, right? They're down on the ground chasing garbage and refuse which is in the street. So crows have to get down and walk uh, to find uh, whatever it is they're going to eat with cars bearing down them on them in, in greater numbers, motorcycles and so on. So it becomes hazardous, that's what I'm saying. And crows are getting uh, killed as a, as a consequence. So there's, that's one consideration. A second uh, possibility is the building construction. Not only is wealth put into cars and motorcycles, it's being put into the construction of apartment blocks. There's a, a massive uh, knocking down of buildings in the core areas of Indian cities, as well as in the suburbs for that matter, uh, and uh, putting up uh, new uh, construction. Some of it is very, very fancy, very, uh, very attractive. I'd be delighted to live uh, in some of them if I could afford it. Uh, but this construction almost inevitably involves cutting down trees, as it does in our country. And uh, if there's nobody there to speak for the trees, then the roosting and nesting uh, uh, location for the crows, which, as I told you before, live in close proximity to humans, these roosting and nesting spaces are destroyed. So tree cutting on a large scale because of urban growth is one of the second of these possible uh, causes of uh, decline. A third possibility is electromagnetic radiation from mobile phone towers. India has the most elaborate mobile phone uh, system in the world. There's seven major mobile phone uh, uh, competitors, and uh, um, uh, every Indian family has a mobile phone. There are more than one billion subscribers to Indian mobile phones, and uh, mobile phones have uh, people never had landlines before. They simply leaped into the mobile phone technology. Uh, very poor people seem to have mobile phones in India. So there's a lot of communication going on. It's a, and it's a great thing. It's a boon uh, to, uh, to India. A lot of problems are solved by being able to reach the people you need to reach. But these mobile phones involve competition among these firms to offer uh, service uh, everywhere. So these uh, base towers, uh, which uh, send out, in effect, uh, electromagnetic radiation of a certain frequency uh, go up everywhere, and the companies don't cooperate with each other to put up a single tower with, uh, you know, with the transmitters for uh, all of them on, on, one, on one tower. Instead, they all put up their own towers. So everywhere you walk around in India, it seems, including in densely settled urban areas, you will see these uh, towers on the top of people's flats. Sometimes they're on the, on the uh, verandas, on the... Uh, yeah, what do we got? Verandas, yeah, that's the word, isn't it? Right. They're on, they're on the uh, verandas uh, just a few feet away from where people are living and sleeping and eating and so on. Electromagnetic radiation in sufficient concentration is dangerous. Uh, and there have been studies done by uh, the Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural Research in India showing that uh, uh, birds and insects are injured uh, by uh, by mobile phone, cell, cell phone uh, towers. So this is an uh, important uh, possibility uh, that we uh, need to keep in mind. A third uh, hazard for the survival of crows in urban areas is that Indi Indians' uh, habits in relation to waste matter have begun to change. Indians, middle class Indians in particular, have begun to put their garbage into plastic bags. Well, that sounds familiar. That's a very modern move to put your uh, food into a plastic bag, twist the top of it, tie the top of it, and then you put it into a plastic container, and then the plastic container is taken and emptied by trucks, and then it goes into a landfill on the edge of the city. The problem is, in that new arrangement, there's no way for the crows to get to the garbage, which is what, for 10,000 years, I'll be more cautious. But for 5,000 years has been common in India, that is to throw the waste on the ground. So the waste on the ground, people stop doing that. That's not a modern thing to do, but the crows have a problem. Crows are clever. I told you they're problem solving. They can break through a polyethylene bag. Yes, they can do that, but they can't expand the hole in the polyethylene bag. You know how it is hard it is to you know, poke your finger through a polyethylene bag. That's exactly the problem of the crows. So there is a real difficulty. The landfills themselves tend to 
uh, uh, after a certain period of time, spontaneously catch on fire. They're producing methane from uh, 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 degradation from anaerobic bacteria. They're, they're creating methane. The methane catches on fire. And so when you go, as again, I cite my friend Margaret Beck, who's sitting over there, we went to the Udaipur landfill and we saw fire, smoke burning everywhere. This is not a congenial place for birds to come and forage for uh, food. So that uh, avenue of, uh, of support. Uh, a municipal disposal of garbage, the compaction of garbage, a whole set in, uh, of changes taking place in uh, disposal is a direct threat to the survival of, uh, of uh, house crows, and they uh, have to look around for other expedients or die. Finally, there is toxins, or there are toxins associated with industrial and chemical practices. I don't want to be very specific about this, but modern our modern economy involves filling the environment with poisons and toxins, some of which are not poisonous or toxic to us humans, but who are very uh, toxic to, uh, to uh, wild, uh, uh, wild animals. Uh, for example, all the vultures in western India, especially in Bombay, 99% uh, of them have been killed off by a common chemical molecule which is, uh, of, uh, doesn't affect humans at all, uh, doesn't affect animals. Uh, uh, dogs and cats and cattle and so on, but it is absolutely fatal uh, to, uh, to uh, vultures. And so there's been a 99% die off of vultures in India. But we're not talking about vultures, we're still talking about crows. So these are the uh, various uh, hazards uh, which, in conjunction, uh, have, uh, are reshaping the urban environment and making it more and more likely that crows are not going to be able to survive there as they have, as I say, for thousands of uh, years. Now, there's one other possibility. It's become, uh, it's more difficult to demonstrate, but it seems to me increasingly likely, and I just pass this on to you. I've told you before how clever corvids are. They're different from other birds. They are not only uh, problem solving, they're collective problem uh, solving. Uh, they, uh, they think outside of the box uh, in the perspective of other crows. And it has been observed in a number of places by uh, uh, bird scientists in different parts of the world, black swan-like events. That is, there are circumstances in which uniquely a whole population of birds in a particular locality will simultaneously decide to abandon, to abandon the scene, to simply leave it. This, is most, uh, uh, this has been most observed in uh, uh, bio, uh, bird reserves uh, uh, on the coast of Florida and in the Americas where there's a greater scientific uh, presence, where one day there will be thousands of birds nesting and the next day they all disappeared. And there's no prologue or explanation to this. A collective uh, uh, decision, if we can say that, with a degree of quotation marks around it, decision by birds uh, to be off, to have no more. Uh, this is too hazardous, we are on. So that's just one possibility that I'm pointing out to you. How are we doing for time, David? Just, we're close. We're close. Okay. <laughs> House crows are threatened. Will they get preservation in India? India has a very elaborate um, animal, bird, plant conservation system and apparatus. It's the most highly developed in uh, uh, in uh, Asia. Um, I, I don't want to go into it in uh, great uh, detail, but I'll just say that tigers, rhinos, and elephants, of course, are celebrated and they all have their own dedicated parks and biosphere reserves. But in addition, there is a Wildlife Protection Act in India introduced by Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister in the 1970s, and it uh, lists out uh, uh, thousands of species which are uh, quite particularly protected from being hunted or collected or uh, harvested in India. This is a wondrous piece of legislation. We actually don't have a law quite this specific in our own, uh, in our own country. And in addition, Mrs. Gandhi introduced in the 1970s a uh, article in the Indian Constitution, which we would do well to consider inserting in our own constitution in this country. It shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures. So school children are taught this from an, from an uh, early age, that compassion and concern for other species is a, uh, a, duty, of, uh, a, is a duty of citizenship. Quite. Quite, uh, quite remarkable. However, 
There is an addendum to the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 I just want to draw your attention to. It identifies four species which are considered vermin and do not deserve the protection given to all other animals, plants, insects, and birds. And guess what is number one on the list of animals considered to be vermin? There it is, it's the common crow. So the crow has been excluded from both constitutional protection of compassion and by law from the protection against hunting uh, and killing at will. So the crow finds itself in a very, very bad spot uh, in India. So to just sort of bring this to a point, the future is clear in India. The, the house crow is on a path of decline. Its population will increasingly retreat. Uh, uh, these are urban birds primarily. They do not survive in the wild like the jungle crow. The jungle crow has the jungle covered, so the house crow cannot take uh, that space. So the future looks very, very, very bleak indeed. But as I say there in the red letter, in the bottom of this slide, there is an unexpected last act, and that is that the house crow has gone global. It has become a diasporic species. At the end of the last century, no, the last but last century, at the end of the 19th century, house crows were deliberately carried by uh, British colonial economic actors into other terrains, other parts of the empire. They were carried to specifically to uh, Zanzibar on the coast of Africa and to Malaysia in Southeast Asia on the hope that the crows would be useful in eating the insect um, uh, uh, enemies of, uh, of uh, spice crops, which were being uh, 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 raised in vast quantities for export profits and so on. The thought was that these crows would help uh, in uh, eating up the uh, insect uh, enemies. So the crow was uh, collected uh, 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 breeding uh, groups were carried uh, abroad into uh, Southeast Asia and to East Africa, and there uh, uh, the crows uh, did their own thing. They said, "Fooey, we're not we're not going to eat insects. Why should we eat insects when people in the cities in these colonies uh, were eating good cooked food?" And they did what house crows do in India. They made a beeline from the countryside to the center of the cities and began replicating the habits of interaction with humans which they had known in India, which was their point of uh, departure. The effect of this is that crows have flourished. The Indian house crow has flourished diasporically in other parts of the world, even though it's under uh, considerable threat in, uh, in India itself. Here is a map uh, you can just see in very general terms of the present range distribution of the Indian house crow. The blue area at the center is its native range in South Asia. The purple dots are present breeding uh, co uh, colonies. And if you look very carefully, you see there is one purple dot in the new world. The house crow has arrived in Florida. Florida, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, new worlds to conquer. I have no fear about the extinction of the house crow. Wherever it goes, the house crow has a long, well, it has a hundred year history of combat with indigenous local species of crows, which invariably the Indian crow defeats in fixed combat, right? The Indian crow defeats these foreign crows on their own land, takes over the terrain, occupies the centers of cities, and reproduces on a large scale. So this is the present uh, situation. There's more to be said about this. I'm sorry I don't have to tell you more. I look forward to your questions. You've been a very attentive audience. Thank you very much. Uh, this question uh, about crows and sickness. Are the crows known to carry and spread disease? as the ancient text would seem to imply. Could they be disappearing in part due to disease? Yes, of course crows, house crows like other crows, like other birds are susceptible to disease. And uh, as we know in Iowa, if you're an attentive reader of the newspaper, uh, West Nile virus uh, fells crows and uh, one is asked by the DNR in Iowa if you find a dead bird in your backyard to bag it and send it to Iowa State Laboratory. They did it sometime in the past. But uh, crows are not more disease ridden than other birds. Uh, they are not more susceptible than other birds. And they are not uh, particularly noted as a disease hazard to human beings. Uh, 
Okay. Um, are there are there cartoon crows that are featured in Indian children's TV? And are, are crows disappearing in Iran and Myanmar and maybe other countries? I don't watch too much Indian uh, children's TV, so uh, this has not been drawn to my attention. It's the sort of thing that I ask about when I travel in India to tell me what, you know, what is the range of things you know about crows and so on. But stories about crows for children are not at all uncommon in Bengal and Kolkata in particular. Um, you may have, you may know the films of uh, the Bengali filmmaker Satyajit Roy, The World of Apu, um, um, famous films, art films in the 1960s and 70s and so on. Uh, Satyajit Roy uh, had a, a beloved uh, a set of beloved ch uh, children's uh, stories in which a crow doctor, a doctor scientist who was a crow, this is a fable, a fabulization I was talking about, uh, um, always uh, solves the crime and gets his man. Okay, I think we've got time for, for one more. You, you mentioned uh, crows bring things to the households, and so this question is asked, what kinds of gifts do how the crows bring to the households? In a word, shiny things. Uh, crows, I mentioned before that they build their nests often on buildings uh, as well as in trees adjacent to buildings and so on. Uh, I have an article in my collection of articles of an x-ray of a, a long-term crow nest built into the cornice of a building in Bombay. And it shows uh, bits and pieces of metal, metal wire, spectacles, wire spectacles, uh, tips of fountain pens and so on, all have been worked into the, uh, into the shaping of this uh, nest, which probably has been in place for decades and so on. But they will bring, like jackdaws and uh, other corvid species, they will sometimes bring to people, uh, fr their friends, uh, shiny objects and, and uh, leave them. So uh, pennies, uh, diamonds and, and rubies, if they can find them, but uh, it, it's junk, but it's a symbolic uh, value and a gift in return for being gifted. Okay. Thank you. We're going to conclude our program. Let's give a big thank you to Paul Greeno. I want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UIA Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we thank today's special sponsors, Mike Margolin and Mike Carberry. We thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. And Paul, as a small token of our appreciation, we are presenting you with our coveted, I think this is his fourth, coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you again for joining us. We are adjourned.